evening, traveller. I almost thought I wouldn't be seeing you tonight, especially around such a place as this. Well, now I've found you. No doubt you want to hear another one of my elaborate and entertaining tales. Yes, I thought you did. Well, traveller, sit down on one of these crates, and I'll tell you the story I call Gold Mine. Bill and Ben, the China Clay Twins, usually work from dawn till dusk at the clay pits, only leaving the confines of the pits in order to deliver shipments of clay to Brendam Docks, or to help out Salty, Porter and the other dockside engines, should goods traffic at the docks back up. There are also the odd occasions where Sir Topham Hatt will request Bill and Ben's assistance in other parts of the island. One day the twins were chatting to each other when the manager suddenly came up to them. Bill, Ben, as our orders for Channel Clay are reduced to a number that Derek and Fergus can sufficiently manage, the fact controllers decide to temporarily reassign you two to working at the Knapford Lead Mines in the wake of a sudden demand for lead tiling. In other words, some f***ing lead off the church roofs again. Well, don't look at me. I don't have anything to do with it. I never said you did. Then why did you give me that funny look when you said it? I didn't look at you in a funny way. I just looked at you. Likely, Star, I wasn't built yesterday, you know. You surprised me the way you carried. Stow it! The pair of you! <sighs> Good grief, I wonder what the poor beggars down the lead mines did to have the fat and chore assign you two to them. The manager walked away as Bill and Ben rolled out of the pits and onto the branch line. They soon arrived at the lead mines where they were met by the mine foreman who eyed the twins with a judgmental eye. Alright you two, here are your instructions. Shunt the empty trucks into the shafts and wait for the men to load them before pulling out. Then you will take them up the line to the yards at Napford, where Dennis will allocate them for dispatch across the island. Got that? Yes, sir. You can count on us, sir. The foreman began to turn away, but suddenly turned back to face the twins as if there was something he'd suddenly forgotten. Oh, and one more thing. Yes, sir? Whatever it is, sir, we'll do it. No slacking. Yes, yes sir. sir. The twins set to work. As per their instructions, they shunted trucks into the shafts, waited until they were filled, and then took them up the line to Napford Yards, where Thomas and Rebecca took them on to their respective destinations after Dennis shunted them onto the appropriate siding. The twins still joked around and caused some mischief, but it was somewhat subdued by their normal standard. This was because they remembered that this was the mine that Thomas fell into when the weakened shaft roof collapsed beneath him after he foolishly passed a danger notice. By evening light, the twins were covered in dust and very tired, so they were very relieved when their crews said it was time to head back to the sheds at Knapford. Come on, bed, stop dawdling. I want you to get back to a nice, warm shed. I can't go, you stalking great idiot. The points are still against me. Oh, that's odd. I just told the signalman that we're setting off for home. He should have changed the points by now. Tell you what, you guys stay here. I'll go see what's up. Stay here? Stay here? Where do you think we're going to go with the points against us? Mount Thomas? Australia? Bill's driver simply just ignored Ben's sarcastic comment as he headed towards the signal box. Ten minutes later, he came back looking most frustrated. Of all the rotten stinking luck! The signalman says he's got the points level wide open, meaning the points should be too, obviously! They've jammed somehow! Don't tell us he's called Morton, but he's either off duty or on another job. Meaning, of course, we'll be stuck in this sign until he's available tomorrow! <sighs> in a nutshell, yes. Bill and Ben grumbled bolshevikly as they watched their crews join the miners as they climbed aboard the shuttle train that would take them back up the line to Napford. Eventually, the twins fell asleep, but Bill later woke to the sound of footsteps. Hmm? Psst. Hey, Ben. Not now, Bill. I'm still asleep. No, you're not. You spoke to me. Oh, um, this is a recorded message. Please leave your message at the sound of the peep. Knock it off, bro. I mean, there's someone in that shaft over there. Yeah, it's probably just a security guard on his rounds. Go back to sleep. Ben, I can see him in his booth, this side of the yard. Plus, there's too many footsteps. Just one guy. Listen. Ben was about to tell Bill to go and get stuffed when there was a sudden blast of a whistle from behind a nearby hut, and the mine suddenly echoed with the sound of gunshots. Oh, God. Oh, help. Someone's shooting at us. Hey, don't shoot. We're British. And I have a pregnant woman in me. Uh, no, you don't, you little liar! 
Shut up, Ben, I was lying on that to get me up being shot. Suddenly, from inside the shaft, there came an almighty explosion, followed by the sounds of rocks falling and the terrified screams of men. Bill and Ben could only listen in horror as they heard the men screaming and shouting. Some of the voices seemed to call out for help from the outside of the shaft, whilst the others sounded like the men inside were arguing amongst each other. Eventually, the dust settled and there was silence. <laughs> what the heck was that? It, it sounded like a gunfight and then the shaft collapsing! Ben, we gotta do something. Like what? Tell the security guard who just apparently slept through what could only be described as World War Three. Look, look, I know what we'll do. Tell our crews in the morning. And I can do stuff and, like, tell management or call the police. Agreed? Agreed. The twins tried to go back to sleep, but it wasn't easy. They kept hearing the desperate shouts of the men from the shaft, making the twins feel all the more uneasy. Eventually, they managed to drop off, but were suddenly awoken by a jarring whistle. Rise and shine, you two, or you'll be late for work. <sighs> uh, oh, sorry, Fergus. It's just... <sighs> we didn't get much sleep last night. We were woke by eerie noises during the night. Oh really? And just what were these uh, eerie noises as you call them? Well firstly I heard footsteps coming from that shaft over there. And then we heard a shrill whistle and gunshots like in the cowboy films. Followed by a large explosion and screams. As rocks fell on people and So you've had an experience have you? Hmm, I'm surprised you don't already know what's going on around here. I mean, surely Edward's told you the tale of this place. No, he hasn't. Ah well, I guess I'll tell you then. In the summer of 53, the manager's office was broken into and the contents of the safe stolen. The police thought it was a gang of opportunists, but one of the detectives didn't think so. He felt the crime was too orchestrated, the crime scene too staged to be genuine. You mean he thought it was an inside job? Exactly. He felt the thieves were a group of miners who waited until the manager went home before letting themselves into the office using a spare set of keys. Once they cleared out the safe, they then hid the loot on site before trashing the manager's office so it looked like a bunch of amateurs had done it. They even stole ten shillings and fourth pence from the petty cash tin so as to make it look credible. What happened then, Fergus? The police did a thorough search of the mines and found the stolen wages stashed in an old toolbox, buried among some odds and ends inside that shaft which the miners were using as a store, thanks to the rock walls being too hard to mine away at. They waited a few days to let the thieves think that the heat had died down, and then lay in wait one night outside the entrance to the shaft. Sure enough, the thieves returned to grab the loot, and that's when the police sprung their trap. But some of the thieves were armed and began to shoot at the police, who in turn, fired back. But how did the shaft collapse? I'm getting to that. It's mostly speculation, but they say one of the thieves ran out of bullets for his gun, and chanced across a crate of dynamite that was being stored in there. They guessed he lit a stick and tried to throw it out at the police, but misjudged his throw and accidentally brought the whole roof down on top of him and his accomplices. Did they ever get them out? They did, eventually. But by then, it was too late. The thieves had either suffocated or murdered one another in a desperate attempt to prolong the expiration of what oxygen remained. There was a sudden clang and the point in front of Bill and Ben swung aside, allowing the twins to leave the siding and return to work, spurred on by a sharp NO SLACKING from the foreman. Bill and Ben still have to visit the lead mines when the work there is too much to handle normally, but they always give the shaft where the robbers died a nervous glance, and as soon as the six o'clock whistle blows, the twins are swift to leave, lest they be forced to stay another night at the mines and listen to the sounds of the crooks, desperately trying to escape the tomb of their own making. Well, traveller, what a tale that was, eh? Yes, I guess it could very well serve as an example of how crime doesn't pay, as that is certainly the message the criminal miners learned in the end. In fact, I am pleased you pointed that out to me, my friend, for I can see that my stories are having the desired impact upon you. Ah, the clock doth toll the hour, and summons me back to my work once again. Save travels, dear fellow, but take my advice. Stay away from the mines as you pass by them, otherwise... You might end up like those poor souls in the shaft.